welcome back it's Neil here and I want to go into the different parts of decentralization measurement incentives transfer pricing so we can get a full understanding of what this framework is all about so let's go to the good stuff shall we so first of all is decentralization and control the reasons for decentralization better access to local information cognitive limitations more timely response focusing of central management training and evaluation of segment managers and motivation of segment managers now each of these reasons are they're kind of related but let's better access the local information so as you decentralize you give more information to salespeople who are on the front line they will get feedback from customers first and foremost customers will complain customers will say mm, I don't like that my your competitor down the road has the same product or service for 10% cheaper and the salesman finds out immediately and so this is what I mean we get local information we get fast information so you want to give empower salespeople to respond to that information that empowerment process is decentralization cognitive limitations and that's really to associate with the information overload that's in your mind okay so if I'm the big owner of the organization I have 5,000 people working for me and I'm making all the decisions well guess what I will not get any sleep I need to do 100 hours of work every day to make all those decisions but there's not enough time in the day to make all the decisions so I need to decentralize okay my cognitive power do I do not have the power to make all the decisions right that's what I mean by cognitive limitations more timely response similar to the first two because I'm given more power to salespeople to make decisions then they can respond faster to a customer they say hey mr. customer oh just a minute okay you you're gonna go down the road for a 10% cheaper product Let, let's see if I do a deal for you okay how about we bundle in another package to go with our product uh, what do you think about that mr. customer customer say oh well that changes it because compared to down the road does not have this other package you see allowing the salesman to have more power enables them to have a more timely response to a change in the market that's caused by competition you see that focusing of central management now central management do, do not have to worry about the day-by-day -day customer interactions they can focus on the month by month the six month by six month the big strategy the theme of the organization the mission of the organization the vision of the organization new product development where is the organization going where is it not going they can focus on the big picture central management can do that training and evaluation of segment managers now segment managers because they're able to make more decisions now you can actually decentralize the training now you can actually give them more experience and therefore they're able to grow and actually provide more meaningfulness in their job role okay finally motivation of segment managers which is related to the second last one because they have more meaning in their job role they're going to be naturally more motivated because when they go to work they don't always have to defer to the boss all the time when there is a query submitted by a customer they can make a decision immediately just like that and so these are the reasons for decentralization now you can bundle all of these reasons together and say well they're basically caused by knowledge transfer costs and basically that's probably the easiest way to describe it and so what causes these reasons normally when an organization gets larger and when an organization has more competition okay they are the and there's more an uncertainty environment caused by government regulation or when an organization goes into a new country then often they may set up a branch so they can start to localize and get more information about what is going on in that country they can't just sort of just copy their own head office practices into the other country and expect the same kind of response in terms of productivity of the employees 
in terms of market response and things like that okay so the environment the way the strategy by going into another country you're creating another environment different set of competitors okay and then there's greater size so you've got information needs there that causes all knowledge transfer costs and so size competition change in the environment or impact on knowledge transfer costs here are the real details of where knowledge transfer costs impacts inside the organization and then that leads us to say look we can't stand anymore we need to decentralize we need to give more authority to managers on the front line yes but there are drawbacks of decentralization and what are they it may hinder coordination among strategic business units now you decentralize different strategic business units they will go and do their own things and you lose some of your focus of your strategy okay one important thing about having a focus strategy for a multinational is coordinating all of the business units we know that it may cause conflict among strategic business units because one business unit wants to do one thing one business unit wants to do another and they both have their own authority to make different decisions that may conflict a customer may go to one business unit while they're visiting Melbourne in Australia and get some support then they go to another one in Sydney and the Sydney unit says oh, I'm sorry you're going to have to pay a little bit extra for this support because we don't serve customers out of state and so the customer may get peeved off because that support is not consistent between the different city divisions you see that so the customer may see this conflict before the organization and so this is an important thing to understand all right so as I mentioned earlier the knowledge transfer costs and agency cost trade-off as knowledge transfer costs go down okay because of decentralizing we our agency costs are going up all right and that's the cost of managers doing the wrong thing okay any conflicts or any lack of coordination of strategy but it, for the most part it, it is also the controls you need to put in place the controls you need to put in place in order to manage these managers all right so measurement and also the incentives you need to give so knowledge transfer costs go down agency costs go up and so we've got to try and balance these things we can't just centralize everything because <gasps> too much for our brain too much cognitive overload information overload we can't handle it all right and there was about four or five or six other things the reasons why we wanted to decentralize all right it's the only way to grow in most cases all right so we have made the decision decentralize and knowledge transfer costs are going down I don't have to make all the decisions I can focus on my strategy I can focus on the big picture and get all my sales managers different divisions doing what they do best but now we need to control all of these divisions otherwise they get out of control so agency costs are going up in that process knowledge transfer costs going down agency costs going up yes so let's have a look at the other side of this balance or imbalance between knowledge transfer costs and agency costs knowledge transfer costs have gone down we have decided to decentralize so now we need to have a system to assign some responsibility now if you assign some responsibility then you need to measure the performance of the responsibility and finally if you assign then measure then you need to have incentive otherwise the hate sets the hard work in the DHL that's direction hard work and personal limitations of the manager the hard work or the motivation of the manager will not happen yes so we've got these three things that we need to balance now we decentralized we need to balance so we create a cost center a revenue center investment center okay or a profit center but now we need to have some measures and we need to have some incentives yes you got it we need to balance these three things if one of them's missing then we have problems 
And so you need to understand what happens if one of these factors is missing? Why do they need to be balanced? Transfer pricing will cover in another section. But let's just keep think about this balance between the three wheels of the car. This is the only car in the world. We can take the rear wheel off and drive around on three wheels. So we want to have that balance between decentralization, measurement and rewards and we call it a three-legged stool. Have you ever sat on a stool and found that it overbalanced? No, the three legs are always the same length. You know that. And this is a really important concept for you to take hold of because once we create the first leg, decentralization, we need to create two more legs and that is we need to measure and we need to reward. Yes, and we, we until we do those two extra legs, we don't have a stool to sit on. That's what we're here now. All right, and so we've got these different scenarios where if we don't have measurement, first scenario, or we don't have decentralization, second scenario, or third scenario, we don't have rewards. Let's see what happens. Scenario one, we don't have measurement. This will result in the worker not being motivated to put in their best interest as there will be an unparalleled match between incentives and effort without proper measurement. In addition, there will be a lack of direction as the incentives given to employees may be seen as an impartial treatment and affect the team's morale. So you need to have measures there that form the basis of different incentives that are being given. And you might think, oh, Frank, he got more than me. How come? Oh, is the boss, It's his, he's the boss's favorite. Oh, that's why he got a better incentive than you. And you get peeved off. Why? Because it doesn't seem to be fair. You know, shouldn't the rewards be given on basis of performance? I've been working my butt off. I've got all these sales. I believe my sales are better than this other person. And I got all these customer responses. Just because a bus doesn't like me, I don't get as higher incentives. I don't get as high a bonus. That's not fair. I'm not going to be motivated. You see that? So if we don't measure, we don't have transparency of visibility of the efforts of the various divisional managers and they're going to get peeved off because of the unfairness even though you start paying out incentives. Mm. The other thing is that divisional managers might go and do their own thing because there's not enough visibility of what they should do and should not do and that could cause harm to the company, the reputation, lost sales. What about if we don't have decentralization? You've got it. Knowledge transfer costs go up or go down. You know knowledge transfer costs are going to go up through the roof. Yes, they know what they should do, but then managers are not given authority. And now managers are not going to be very happy either. I'm a divisional manager. I'm a divisional manager. I'm in charge of this division, but I have to refer all the big decisions to my boss. Why can't I make them myself? Why can't I be responsible for the KPIs in my organization, in my division? Yes. So they're not able to make the cr crucial decision. There are tight controls in place to measure them. Thus, they may result in frustration and a lack of motivation. In addition, there will be also an increase in knowledge transfer costs as the top management may not have access to a local environment. Knowledge transfer costs, remember, cognitive overload. Ah! Okay, you know, information overload, okay, and you get information too late, and so you have um, poor decision making, inaccurate decision making because the decisions are made too late. Mm. So that's what happens in no decentralization. What happens when there's no reward? There'll be a lack of motivation, even though they'll have the autonomy to do anything and measurements of effort are in place they are still going to end up with fixed or comparable pay. Here, there is a case when incentives do not match up to the effort put in. So you've got the authority. You're being measured and monitored, but you do all the right thing. You perform better than your other, div you perform better than the neighboring division in sales, but you don't get a better reward. And you're thinking, oh, why should I try hard? 
why don't I just do average? Why? Because the person that works harder than me is not going to get paid more. And so I will just do average. I will not try harder. I will not grow my division because there's no rewards. So what I've just taken you through here is the three scenarios. If there's no measurement, then we lose accountability. If there's no decentralization, knowledge transfer costs go through the roof. Yay. If there's no reward, then we lose that motivation. We lose that motivational factor, that incentives that will force you to really try hard and hit those KPIs. Okay, got that? So we need those three legs of the stool to go together. And your focus should understand if one of those legs are missing, then what are the consequences? Yes. All right. So that's what I've taken you through now. The three legged stool. One, two and three. And now we can go in a little bit more detail of the one, two and three. We're going to cover responsibility centers. Then we're going to look at transfer pricing. In another section, in another week, we're going to have a look at financial measures, return on investment, okay, residual income, EVA, economic value added, and then we can look at rewards associated with them. But that's in another week, in another section. For now, the rest of this section, maybe in the next part, we're going to look at responsibility centers and the types and transfer pricing. So what do we mean by financial results controls? Because we're a large organization, accounting is the best aggregate measurement system to track, monitor, and hold accountable the responsibility of different divisions, of different managers. And so we call these responsibility parts responsibility centers. Now, when we talk about three elements here, it's basically the three legged stool again. All right. So responsibility centers, formal management processes, which is the measurement. And then we've got motivational contracts, which is the incentives, all right, decentralization, measurement and incentives. So we're not going to go into too much detail about the management processes but that includes planning and budgeting. And in the following week, we're going to look at motivational contracts where we look at the incentives. Mm. So what are the types of responsibility centers? Responsibility accounting has the following type of incentives. There is a cost center only responsible for costs. There's a revenue center that's only responsible for revenues. Profit center, responsible for both revenues and costs. And investment center, responsible for revenues, costs and investments. So you can think about it. For the most part, cost centers are very, very popular when you want to keep the lid on costs. You want to control costs. And especially for non-sales divisions. Whereas a sales division may either be a revenue center or a profit center. Mm. Investment center is more likely for a subsidiary that is in another country that is having that has a distinct product and service package and sort of an independent operation from your own head office in a, in your home country, right? So keep that in mind. These are the different types of responsibility centers. Now there are two different methods of implementing. There are two different methods of implementing cost strategic business units for producing and support departments. The first one is a discretionary cost method and the second one is an engineered cost method. And what do we mean by the two? Most organizations around the world do focus on use a discretionary cost method. That is, oh, you have a budget and you have a one million budget and your last year, inflation's gone up 5%, we will give you a 1.05 million budget this year. And that's you in a discretionary amount, you're kind of using a rolling budget and maybe adjusting it for inflation, you see. 
So you're not taking into account the efficiency or the effectiveness of the productivity of the people in that unit. You're not looking at the inputs, you're not looking at the outputs, you're just looking at a fixed amount and you're using historical benchmarks or you're using benchmarks of other competition around the say how much the budget should be. That's discretionary and very much top down. Whereas an engineered cost method is okay, oh, you're the records keeping office in the university, you have a $10 million budget and you're serving maybe 10,000 students. So that's a thousand dollars per student. Oh, you're going to serve 11,000 students in the coming year. So you should have $11 million budget. However, we want you to make a 10% improvement in productivity. So we're going to give you only 10 million and basically for the 11,000 students, we're gonna basically engineer that cost to serve each student from 1,000 per student down to 900 and a bit per student. Can you see that? So we're focusing on the input output relationship. We're actually focusing on productivity improvements. We're focusing on a fit in efficiency enhancements to get more effective productivity out of a division. And that is an engineered cost method. And you need to have very good measures to really understand that. But that's another way of negotiating either from a divisional manager point of view or from a head office point of view, negotiating with a higher or lower budget in the coming period. And if you're facing increasing competition, then the engineered cost method becomes more effective because it places greater accountability on what you are focusing your costs on in that division. How much does it really cost you to serve each student? Mm, are there some students that are more costly than others? Is some way that we can deal with problematic students that actually cause more of our resources than other students? You see, student profitability analysis. Ah, you got that, haven't you? All right. So you see how the engineer cost method changes the whole mentality of a division. When they know that that budget is tied to how efficiently they are dealing with record keeping of the students. Yes, yeah, so there you have a discretionary cost method, which is probably most popular because it doesn't put that pressure on various cost center units. But then there's the engineer cost method, which I believe should be used more frequently than what it is. So let's just have a look at the next part. And basically, a summary of what we mean by discretionary cost centers and engineer cost centers. So discretionary, we're just focusing on inputs. Here's your money. We're not going to look at your input to output conversion or your productivity. Whereas engineered, we're focusing on the efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. And we're using that to justify the budgets that are given or taken away from period to period. Okay, now we want to go to transfer pricing. Okay, that was the responsibility centers. Now we're going to transfer pricing. I want to cover that in another section. In the next session, I want to take you through transfer pricing. We're going to go into that in much more detail. Transfer pricing strategy, how you do the calculations, what are the minimum and maximum transfer prices to use depending on the circumstances and so forth. But we'll cover that in the next section. Thank you for watching and catch you in the next session. Bye for now.